The gifts of the Spirit are abundant and available to all. They enrich and enlighten our path through mortality as we do our best to serve God and man. So what are we to make of the gift of prophecy? Who is it for and how does it work? Through the gift of prophecy and the many other gifts of the Spirit, our faith and compassion increase exponentially until that hopeful day when we can say like Paul, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? I invite you to join us in our study today and encourage each of us to request divine understanding that the Spirit may teach us individually and specifically. Welcome to Come Follow Up. When I think about what the gifts of the Spirit are, it's really anything that can help build the kingdom of God on earth. So anything that helps bring us to Christ is a gift of the Spirit. Some of the gifts of the Spirit, uh, really they're as many as you can think up, and th they're meant to bless uh, other people, like God's, God's children. So gift of prophecy, gift of wisdom, gift of administration. I feel like there are so many different um, gifts of the Spirit, and they come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, and I, I love that each, each spiritual gift we have is uniquely um, given to us for specific reasons, and it looks different in every person. Welcome, everybody. My name is Ben Lomu, and I'm your host. Our gospel scholar for today is Tyler Griffin. Tyler is a teaching professor in the Department of Ancient Scripture at BYU and is also an associate dean of religious education. Prior to coming to BYU in 2010, he taught seminary and institute for 13 years. He and his wife, Kiplin, have 10 children, five boys and five girls. Tyler, thanks for being here. It's such a pleasure to join you for this episode. And next to Tyler is our special guest, Kenneth Packer. Ken is the current director of language training and curriculum at the Provo Missionary Training Center. He has a PhD in instructional psychology and technology with an undergrad degree in Russian and business. As a young man, Ken served as a full-time missionary in Russia and later served with his wife in the Ukraine Kiev mission. Ken, welcome. Thanks, Ben. It's good to be here. And we're excited to get to know you and discuss the scriptures with you as we discuss our two topics for today. And we're also joined by our studio audience. Thank you as well for being here. And to the viewers at home, thank you for joining us. Throughout the discussion, we'll invite you to share your experiences with us on any of our social media platforms. For downloadable resources and study and teaching, visit byutv.org slash come follow up. So the two topics we're gonna to be discussing today are first, I can seek the gift of prophecy, and second, Christ overcame sin and death for me. So our first topic, I can seek the gift of prophecy. Tyler, can you give us a little bit of a background onto why we're discussing specifically about prophecy in these chapters? Absolutely. So to better understand this first topic here as it comes to us in chapter 14, it might be helpful to, to step back a few paces from this chapter and look at the whole book for just a second. First Corinthians is actually not the first letter that Paul sent to the Corinthian saints. It's the second letter. In chapter five, he, he mentions to them that he had sent them a letter, then they had sent a response, and now this letter, which we call First Corinthians, is actually, should be Second Corinthians, um, he's responding to some very specific feedback that he got from them in that letter, and we don't have either his first letter okay. or the response back from them. Okay. So we don't have those. We can guess some of the things based on what's in here. What we know is he spent 18 months there among these saints, and now he's away and he's writing these letters to kind of regulate the, the way they're running the church there in Corinth, which is a crossroads of the ancient world. It's right there in this major trade route between two seas, and there are people coming in from all over the world into Corinth. And there are people being introduced to the gospel of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. from a variety of backgrounds. So you have in that same congregation, as you do throughout the other epistles, you have converts into the Christian church from Judaism, and you have converts that were Gentiles from paganism. And there's going to be some difficult uh, situations that they have to navigate, and this is one of them here in chapter 14, because you're going to have some people overemphasizing certain gifts of the Spirit, 
underemphasizing or misunderstanding other aspects of the gifts of the Spirit. And so this is a very uh, uh, powerful corrective chapter that chapter 14 actually is the conclusion of chapter 12 and 13, which talk about the gifts of the Spirit as a whole. And here he's really going to focus in on two gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues and the gift of prophecy, and really help us to understand how those two fit inside of their cultural context in the church at that time. Okay, so let's start with the gift of prophecy. Ken, why is it important for Paul to teach them about the gift of prophecy in this situation? I, I think there's some uh, important things for all of us to remember. We all can seek a spiritual gift, and uh, the spiritual gift of prophecy is, is an important one, uh, directing one's life, directing one's family, understanding where to go. And he sees this group of people who are getting up in front of other people and, 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 and speaking in tongues that aren't understood by anyone else. And, and he's helping them to see, you can seek the gift of prophecy, uh, but he outlines some different things that help us to know what we need to do that we don't get off course. And, and he corrects this gift of tongues notion that they have, and then also uh, teaches them some really important things about how to seek a spiritual gift. When we're talking about prophecy, you can get out of bounds. You, mm -hmm. you, can, you, can, you can get to a place that's not good, and, and he's kind of putting some bounds around that. Okay, so to help us better understand these bounds, uh, maybe we should talk about uh, what is what does he mean by a gift of prophecy? Because I think if you just look at the word, you might misinterpret what he's talking about. So from Paul's uh, point of view, when he says, look, I want to, you seek after the gift, gift of prophecy, what does he actually mean by that? That's a great question. The reality is, is, when we look at the word in English, prophecy, it kind of denotes this idea of what a prophet does mm -hmm. to see the future and to prophesy about what's going to come. And there's absolutely that element at play here. But in other scriptures and in other prophetic commentary, we learn that prophecy is this ability to know that Jesus is the Christ, to be able to have that firm testimony of the Lord and and to have that be that guiding light for you, which in one way is helping you to prophesy the mm -hmm. future. Because if I'm connected with Christ, I know my future. I may know, not know exactly what it's going to look like, but I have a pretty good idea of what the promises are. It's that I don't have to go through life shaking and wondering, oh no, uh, what's going to happen to me? Because I'm secure in my relationship with Christ, which gives me a element of that gift of prophecy moving forward. All right, thank you. Ken? At the MTC, we teach missionaries who are learning a new language, and we teach them about seeking the gift of tongues. And there are five principles that we've uh, kind of boiled it down to that we share with them. We decorate this with the gift of tongues, but it works for any gift. If you're seeking the gift of prophecy, this works. If you want to be a better teacher, if you want the gift of knowing the Savior, these, these principles apply. Uh, you've got to believe in it. You've got to ask for it. You've got to work for it. You've got to be worthy of it because it's a spiritual gift, and then you have to do it for the right reasons. Uh, if you're doing it for yourself, wrong reason. It's to glorify God and it's to bless his children. So those are some of the bounds that, and some of the principles that would help as we seek the spiritual gifts. It's not to edify yourself. It's for the right reason. Verse 19, he says, it's more important that I speak five words to the understanding of someone else than it is to say a lot of words that, that people don't understand. So uh, if you're getting up there and, and speaking in tongues that people didn't understand, uh, that's for you, but no one else in that group understands anything that you're saying. Mm -hmm. And Paul is saying, hey, it's more important that when we, when we teach, we're, we're understood. And you have to not only understand intellectually, it's, it's something that's in your heart. And that's the most important thing for missionaries as they go out. It's not just speak in a language. Uh, that they understand intellectually. It's also having that go into their hearts and that ha helps to edify them. You know, that's also beautifully worded in verse 12 when he said, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts. So as you're saying, this isn't just for the, the gift of speaking in tongues, it's for all spiritual gifts. If you're zealous for getting them, 
here's the, the qualifier, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. It's not for the gratifying of my pride or building up my kingdom, it's for building up the kingdom of God. I love that, maybe tying it back to chapter 13 that we just came from. You know, charity is the most important of those spiritual gifts to seek. And without that, we drive away the spirit and 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 to have the gift of prophecy, we need the spirit because the spirit is that voice that's delivering it to to others. And verse ten in this chapter says, "There are it may be so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without significance." And I, you know, all voices are important uh, to hear. The, the most important voice that we could hear is is His, and we have to we have to seek that. We have to strive for it. So within these chapters, in chapter 14 specifically, uh, Paul compares the gift of tongues with the gift of prophecy. What's the connection between those two gifts? It's a good question. So he, he's, he's using, he's setting up this contrast where he says, if you're speaking in tongues, you're having an experience with God. But if you're speaking with the spirit of prophecy and revelation, you're benefiting the whole church. Unless, now with the gift of tongues, if there's somebody who can interpret the tongue so that everybody in the congregation can understand what was said, then everybody can benefit. So that's why he sets up some checkpoints for this okay. gift of speaking in tongues. Look, for instance, at verse 27. He says, if any man shall speak in an unknown tongue or in another tongue, Joseph Smith would change, let it be by two, or at the most, three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So mm -hmm. he's, he's putting this check in place that, you know what, if nobody's there to interpret, just keep that between you and the Lord. Don't draw attention to yourself. And that's such a, a unique concept, the idea of doing things to be seen of the world, right? Like how foreign is that? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus has something to say about that. <laughs> so Ken, how have you come to understand the gift of tongues through your professional career? Yeah, th this one is a little different than what we're talking about here because you're seeking uh, to learn a new language so that you can be understood mm -hmm. by, um, th but sometimes missionaries begin to, to Maybe they want a naval career uh, after their their missions, and so they're learning Mandarin so that they can become an admiral one day. Wrong reason. Mm -hmm. They need to be seeking that gift because they believe in it. They need to be asking for it every prayer. They need to plead with the Lord to to give him that, and uh, then they have to work. They have to work their their guts out to learn this. There'll be times in their mission where maybe they say something that they've they've never studied or understand something that they've never read. But most of it is that they they have to work. They have to work for it. Now, you've got to be worthy. The best missionary is a repenting missionary. Same thing for obtaining and understanding the voice of the Spirit. You know, understanding that that they're the same principles. If you're trying to build yourself, that gift of prophecy will come. There'll be things that that God teaches you. If it's for your family, uh, even better. You can receive direction. My wife. Uh, was having dreams months before uh, we were called to go back to Kiev, and she kept telling me, "Ken, do you do you feel that? This feels like there's something going to change." And I'm like, "Nope." <laughs> I was <laughs> I was serving as the bishop. Uh, I I just finished a PhD, uh, and I just I I didn't want to ask the Lord if my wife was receiving some direction mm -hmm. for our family. And I decided that I needed to humble myself. And so I knelt down and I said, Heavenly Father, I am so sorry I've kept this back, but my wife's been having this feeling. Should I be having this feeling? And I had an overwhelming yes. It was just a week or two later that we received a call to go back to Kiev, Ukraine. And so my wife is always more in tune than, than I am. And I think that the lesson for me was, we keep confidences, God doesn't have to. And he was letting my wife know because we had two months before we went out, that was it. We had two months to get our home in order to go out. And she needed that. 
And I could have had the same thing had I been seeking it. Mm. I didn't want to seek that because I didn't want to know. Uh, but when I did seek that, God was very generous. I'm so grateful for that. And I know that that's possible for each one of us, that, that God will be very generous in, in guiding us if we'll seek that um, in our lives. And what a great gift for your wife to have to, you know, to, for her to receive that, like you said, to help prepare her for this big life-changing event. And I wanted to touch on a couple of scriptures uh, in chapter 14, uh, verses 39 and 40, where Paul says, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. We had a question come in from one of our viewers uh, specifically about these verses, and I'd like to watch it and then get some of your thoughts. Hey, my name is Viviana Courier. I currently reside in Albertville, Alabama. And my question for you guys today is, what does Paul mean when he asks us to covet, to prophesy? Most of the time when we hear the word covet, you know, uh, the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. So what does Paul mean when he says we should covet to prophesy? It's a really good question. The, the reality is, is to covet is to look at something that you don't have yet and desire that, that it be given to you in some regard. And so if you look at the, at the commandments given to Moses on Mount Sinai, that mm -hmm. thou shalt not covet, right. <laughs> then you get a list of additional things that you're not supposed to covet, which are things that belong to other people that you're not supposed okay. to have. In this case, I think the beautiful uh, way that this word is placed in our King James Version is that we're not coveting something that somebody else has so that I can selfishly take it from them for myself. Okay. This doesn't, it, it's not a matter of dividing the, the gift between people. God is a God of abundance. He has plenty of the gift of prophecy to shed forth abroad upon all of his children on the earth. And so we're not coveting it from individuals, we're coveting it from heaven which is totally different than the context okay. of thou shalt not covet things from other people. All right, that's a great explanation. I'd love to hear from the audience, how has your life been blessed through the gift of prophecy? David. Uh, with what has been shared, it keeps coming to my mind that we're calling, right? We are all in church, we have a calling, right? And even if you don't have one officially, you still minister, right? So. With that question also comes to my mind that you seek revelation mm -hmm. to help those who you are called to serve in that calling. Um, I have been all this grown president, I have been a teacher, I have been in different callings, but one thing that I have found is like, if I want to serve them, he knows how. Whatever calling you have, you can ask the Lord how you can benefit those. How can I benefit you know, others? As we are learning here, you know, I want this to help others, right? which at the same time, they help you grow your own testimony. And that really does speak to the idea that we seek after these gifts for the benefit of everybody. Thank you both for your insights and for sharing with us and audience. Thank you for your participation as we've talked about seeking the gift of prophecy. And for you at home, what insights have you gained today about seeking the gift of prophecy? What does seeking the gift of prophecy look like to you? Find us on Facebook and share with us. The whole purpose of life is to uh, return to live with our Heavenly Father again. Um, and it's through the atonement of Jesus Christ and it's through repentance and trying again that it makes that possible. Because um, if, if we didn't have those second chances, there it'd be over. I mean, I'm not perfect. I, I fail every single day. I make mistakes. But um, thanks to Jesus Christ and thanks to His atonement, I can get up, I can move forward knowing it'll be okay. There's always hope. Even if you make a mistake, even if you feel that what you've done is just unrepentable, knowing and understanding the atonement and having that opportunity to do over with a sincere heart, contrite spirit, allows for the Lord to love you, show you that He loves you, and for you to be able to be renewed. When you're on a road and you get a flat tire, you don't start the, you don't start the trip again. You don't fix it and go back. You can continue, right? In my life, that example has helped me to know that, yeah, I made a mistake. But that doesn't define me. Chris, Christ does. So I can, you know, stand up and continue. And He will be there all the way to the road. Even if there's another flat tire, if there's another challenge, 
He's gonna be there, holding my hand and helping me and growing as I go. The second topic we're gonna to discuss today is Christ overcame sin and death for me. Tyler, what's the scriptural context that leads into this second topic? Good question. So chapter 15, as Paul is kind of getting ready to close his letter to the Corinthian saints, it's become very apparent that they have in their church, there in Corinth, this doctrine has crept in, probably from Gentile converts, um, that there is no such thing as resurrection. Pretty sad. It's pretty sad mm -hmm. because the, this old Greek philosophy that was really made popular by Plato, so we're going back almost four centuries before Christ, this idea has permeated their whole culture that the body is bad, that it's just kind of this, this anchor for the spirit during your life, and once you die, finally your spirit can soar and, and ascend. And so the idea that you would come back and take up a physical body again to the, to the Gentile converts, they're having a hard time with it. And so he's really going to go after that notion here where they're preaching against the resurrection and he's re-enthroning it as the most important doctrine is that Christ died for you and he rose from the grave because he overcame sin and death in behalf of each of us. Okay, so Ken, maybe you can answer this question for us. What is the significance of Christ's victory over death? Well, that's a good question. I, it's taking me back to a home that I was in in Boston with some missionaries. And it was a man from England, and uh, they had just had a, a, a brand new baby girl, this young couple, and the missionaries were teaching them. And they were worried about this little girl growing up in, in the world, and they wanted to protect her and, and, and help her. But he, I remember him raising his hand and saying, why is it that Christ came when he did? I didn't know the answer to that. The missionaries didn't know the answer to that. Uh, well, he just came when he did. And it, we went on with the, with the lesson. And then a few minutes later, he, he said, hold on just a second. I know why. He couldn't have come at the beginning he came so that we had scriptures and prophecies and everything that he would come and he would be here. Uh, that's why he came at the point that he did. And now we have witnesses from the scriptures here. Uh, we have witnesses in verses, you know, eight, nine, 10. And then he says, even I have a witness that Christ has, has been resurrected. That's important because it gives us hope. Uh, it's hard to lose someone that we love. It's hard to face oblivion. And he's helping these saints to understand that. Uh, not only does it comfort us, but it also helps us to make better choices in this life as we, as we move forward. How do you go from the, the beliefs that some of them are perhaps bringing in about life and about death and about sin to help them really see and understand that we can, through Christ, overcome it? Well, the key to the question is that last phrase, through Christ. It's only through Christ and you put your hope, your trust, your faith in Christ, and he's the one who facilitates that almost a micro version of the macro resurrection and renewal of soul that will ultimately take place in those little moments of life when we feel spiritually dead or mentally broken, and he can bring that new life, and we put our hope in him. And it's only through his power that we can actually have the hope that's described here. I was just thinking that he essentially says, I'm a nobody. He, I was persecuting the, the church, and I know, I came to know who, who Christ is. And, and this is what he can do for you, what he's done for me. And, and I know in my own life, the only reason I am who I am is um, what Paul says here in verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was bestowed on me. And, and I've seen that in my, in my own life. I've, I've made mistakes. The monster of death is not scary anymore. The monster of sin is, though, because all of us are going to be resurrected. That's that's a given. We will live again. But 
those mistakes that we make are ours to bear unless we come to him, unless he takes that from us. And, and Paul is teaching this. Verse 56, he says, the sting of death is sin. The sting of death is, is gone because we'll all be resurrected. But, but the sting of, of, of sin it is still there unless we accept him. And, and, and Paul knows that better than, or maybe just like all of us, because he, he was a sinner. And through Christ, he has been healed. So how, how did you learn that lesson, you know, that, that Ken Packer can be, uh, can overcome this sting of, of, of sin and death through Jesus Christ? Well, there's a lot of personal stories I wouldn't share <laughs> because they're mine to go. Uh, you know, when I was uh, when I was a boy, um, I was embarrassed because someone said, "Hey, Ken, why do you wear the same shirt every day to school?" And I'm like, oh, "What are you What are you talking about? I'm a, I was having an amazing life, you know, until I noticed that, and then." Uh, wow, people had different shirts all the time. And uh, so I went home and I told my mom, I'm, I'm not going to school tomorrow unless I have a new shirt. And she said, no, you're going to school. And I said, no, I'm not going to school. And uh, so she probably pulled out the Kenneth Boyd, you're going to school. So I said, okay. I went out the front door and I went in the back door and I hid. Uh, under my bed and my mom came down and she said we'll go and get you a new shirt and we went down to the store you could pick out the shirt and then you ironed on what you know what thing you wanted I chose a yellow shirt and a soccer player kicking someone else in the head and I don't I was since fifth grade or whatever so, but I, I got that and I went to school and I was I was the king of this the, the school for the day I People pat me on the back. Congratulations, this is amazing. And I felt good that that shame and, and guilt of, of not having uh, as many shirts as everyone else did went away. Uh, but then I understood that my mom uh, had sacrificed and my family had sacrificed. Rather, there was a different kind of a guilt or shame that came that I couldn't go away. I'd embarrass my mom. I'd, and... I learned that you could kneel down and you could ask God for forgiveness and he could help you. And I could ask my mom for forgiveness and it worked. And you know, it's worked every time since. If I go to him and I ask for help and forgiveness, he can make those things that we do wrong right. And I'm grateful for that. I know, I know he has that power. Thank you so much for, for sharing that experience and for inviting the Spirit with us in this room. So how have you used this knowledge that we could overcome uh, sin and death through Christ to bless your life? Joanna. I think it's very thoughtful that our Heavenly Father knew we were going to mess up many, many times in our lives if we didn't have the atonement. There have been many times in my life where I've been able to, to really ponder and have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness. There was a time before my mission and I knew I needed to talk to my bishop to get everything started and I needed to take care of some things. And I was listening to our institute teacher and he said, you will not be able to fake the spirit on your mission. You, you have to take care of everything. And so this was a really big feeling. I knew I needed to talk, but the shame and the guilt that I mm -hmm. felt was preventing me um, in my own selfishness. Like I, I just didn't want to confront this. And so I was working a night shift and I was on my way home and it was like past midnight and I was just listening to some music. I felt overwhelming feeling like you need to pull over. And I pulled over and I just started to pray on the freeway. And I just asked my Heavenly Father, like, is there any way that you can forgive me for this? Is there any way that if I overcome this, like, I will still be accepted by you? And I, it was the first time I've ever felt this, but I felt my Heavenly Father's arms around me. 
And it was a confirmation that no matter how far we stoop from our Heavenly Father, nothing is too far from His reach to, to always love us and to show us His love. And so if it wasn't for Jesus Christ dying for us and atoning for our sins, there would be no way for us to come back from our mistakes. And I'm very thankful that we have the opportunity to, to become clean again. Joanna, thank you for sharing uh, such personal feelings with us. This just speaks perfectly to what Paul is teaching uh, in chapter 15, uh, verses 20 through 22, when he says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. What does Paul teach the Corinthians to kind of bring to them this sense of, of peace, this sense of, I can overcome some of the trials that life throws at us? Good question. I mean, the, the entirety of chapter 15 is him using example after example after example of why we can put 100% of our faith and trust in him to redeem us and to forgive us. And and it's not just for that end goal of coming out of the grave at resurrection, as important and, and significant as that is, but it's these daily repentance and forgiveness experiences that he is providing for us. And so you get all these examples that Paul gives to shore up their faith and to kind of prove to them that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true and because of that, there's hope for us, not just at the end, but there's hope for me today, right now. I, I see everything that Paul is teaching, he's bringing this message of peace, that no matter what situation you're in, we can overcome uh, physical, spiritual death. And I just wanna thank you all for contributing, for sharing uh, your experiences and your spirit with us today, as we talked about overcoming sin and death through Jesus Christ. And for those at home, uh, we have a lot to cover uh, with Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. Uh, next up is Footnotes, our deeper dive with Tyler and Ken into the scriptures. On Come Follow Up today, I think something that really touched me was when someone was talking about their hope in Christ over sin and death, really having an impact on how they felt about their individual worth. And I hadn't made that connection before. And so I think as I study more in the New Testament, I can look at it with new eyes and think, okay, hey, how does this pertain to my own individual worth and how I feel about myself? The show today has shown me that um, the Spirit is teaching me by others, right? I have my own experiences that I love to share, but hearing the stories of others help me to see like, wow, it is amazing how God responds to each one of us because that means that He knows all of us individually. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We dismissed our studio audience that are looking forward to building upon our previous discussions about prophecy, redemption through Christ, and other passages from 1 Corinthians chapters 14 through 16 with Tyler and Ken. Gentlemen, welcome. Okay, so um, I kind of want to start from the end of these chapters. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul says, uh, verses 23 uh, specifically, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And I love how Paul is, he always brings it back to Christ. His teachings are so Christ-centered, um, but I'm intrigued by this word grace. Uh, that, he, that he puts in there, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he brings us up elsewhere as well throughout these chapters. What can we learn about Paul speaking to grace and Jesus Christ? You know, I think the, the simplest way to answer that question is Paul himself, back in chapter 15, verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. He feels so redeemed as he, as the lowliest member of that quorum of 12 apostles at that time, as he looks at these others and he considers they were, most of them were with Jesus throughout his ministry. And I'm, I'm late to this game. And he came in a very different way than any of them. Mm -hmm. He had persecuted the church. He had been there when Stephen was stoned. He was on his way to Damascus with letters to arrest other Christians and he feels keenly his redemption. And so, is it any wonder that Paul would emphasize this notion of grace 
in in his writings, probably more than anybody in, mm-hmm. in scripture, because he feels it so deeply, so keenly. And Paul's not the only one that talked about that when Nephi is, this is my favorite scripture in all of the scriptures. It's also my Netflix password. Uh, <laughs> there so, you go. <laughs> this is, a, this is a, a way to get your kids to memorize where scriptures are at if you make it, you know. Oh, yeah. Now they think that this is their favorite scripture. Uh, but it's 2 Nephi 25, 23. For we labor diligently to write to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. I just love that scripture. I'm curious on this phrase, um, it is by grace we are saved after all we can do. What does that mean? After everything we do, we're saved by grace? Or how do we uh, explain these verses, uh, this, this verse specifically about grace and our part in receiving grace? You know, that's interesting because often the way that has been interpreted in the past is that I need to do steps A through Y. And if I'll just get through all of those 25 steps, then after all that I can do, then Christ will step in and get me to point Z at the end. And I don't think that's what Nephi meant at all. The reality is, from my own personal experience and from, from interacting with a lot of people in a lot of settings through my life, the reality is, is I can't get from point A to point B without his grace. And I can't get from point B to point C without his grace. I can't go anywhere that matters or become anything that's worth becoming without his grace. There's never a time when I, when I wake up in the morning and I say, huh, I'm looking at my schedule and I'm seeing what's, what's in my day. You know what? I got this. Hmm. I, I don't need your help. I don't need your grace. I, I'm good today. I'll check in again tomorrow and see if I need you then. There's never a moment that I don't desperately, not just a little bit, but completely need to rely upon him, his strength, his power, his inspiration to be able to to do things, do the right things for the right reason to actually grow up to become more like him spiritually and in, in other ways. And I love that explanation because I think sometimes we think that we have to earn this grace. Um, do we want to jump into some of these topics and, and yeah. see uh, what we can learn from them and what Paul's teaching? Can I just say that if you if you look back at chapter 14 now, the beginning chapter of our scripture chapters today, I think it's fascinating that Paul, as he's talking to these Corinthian saints about their struggles with understanding the the gift of speaking in tongues and the gift of prophecy and revelation. Um, Look at verse 7 and 8. It says, And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall be known what is piped or harped? It's funny because he is a really powerful scripture writer where he's he's not giving uncertain sounds. He's he's very clear, he's very persuasive, he's very direct. And then it ties into verse 8. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Which is, I find so ironic because often you'll see people who who get frustrated with prophets in antiquity as well as living prophets today because they don't like what's being said. And yet it's the prophet's role to give a very clarion sound, a call from the Lord to, to rally the troops and to go a certain direction. And Paul's pretty clear in the direction he's giving these Corinthian saints. And I think our prophets today are being pretty clear with many things as far as how to move forward with with greater faith and trust in Christ. Very clear, very certain. A certain call. No mistake. You know, I I think visually a lot and there's there's a special whistle that they use on on ships the Bozen whistle, you know, that's that that whistle that you hear in movies and things like that. And they use that on purpose because when there's storms and winds, 
uh, that can pierce through all mm-hmm. of that all of that noise, and it, and it's not the captain that does that. It's it's one of the officers that's that's doing that. So he's taking the the direction from the uh, captain, and he's blowing it out so that everybody knows what to do. Pull the sails down, put them up, to move them there so that they can get through this storm. And it, it, just as you were talking about that, you know, prophets and and that that voice can cut through mm-hmm. everything. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into some of these doctrinal things. Um, and one of the first ones that Paul talks about is uh, we, we touched on earlier is the resurrection. Chapter 15, uh, verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. What are we to learn from this? Uh, and why is Paul trying to really emphasize this with the Corinthians about uh, the doctrine of resurrection. So the struggle here is that there is a very, very strong uh, sentiment against the physical body. And you can kind of see where that would come from. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we mentioned before that Plato is the one who kind of popularized this idea among the Greeks. The, the uh, phrase that he used is, the body is a tomb. So that that teaching now permeates that whole Mediterranean region for for four centuries. And then Jesus comes along and he's going to preach a very different doctrine about the significance of the physical body, that it flies in the face of this Greek philosophy that nah, it, it doesn't matter what you do with your flesh, with your body, because it's just a tomb anyway. And so, uh, the way that they're looking at this is, um, once I've died, I can now be free. And Paul's preaching this core doctrine that, no, the, the true freedom is power to have flesh and spirit combined forever in a perfected form. Verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds, and there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. And then he compares the, the stars as they differ in glory. And we love this tied into Doctrine and Covenant section 76, mm-hmm. this doctrine that you are going to, to get back whatever law you were willing to abide or live in this life, you you reap what you sow. (laughs) And he uses the example of a seed in verse 37, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that be, but bear grain. In other words, you you put this seed in the ground, you plant this dead body in the ground, and a different body is going to grow. And it's not the same. As much as I wish strawberries would would sprout from my wife's tomato plants. It's just not gonna, it's just not gonna happen. <laughs> if you sow seeds of wickedness your whole life, you're not going to produce mm-hmm. and harvest fruits of righteousness. I, I love this. When you combine all these things, we're talking about resurrection, we're talking about baptism, we're talking about degrees of glory. Uh, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we can see a lot of these teachings you know, with a lot of the covenants that we make today. Uh, Ken, do you want to speak to, to just the, um, the connection that we, we still cling to with Paul's teachings and how it relates to us today? Yeah, I, one of the most beautiful doctrines of the restored gospel is the covenants that we make in the temple. We know that it doesn't matter where you were born, when you were born, uh, you will have access to Jesus' atonement, and that's where you can find equality in this life. I remember a man coming into the mission office in in Kiev, and it's right on the temple site there. And he was meeting with the missionaries, and he'd just come out of prison. He'd spent 25 years in a in a Ukrainian prison. While he was there, he said that he had... Uh, plans for a generator that would generate energy for free and would fix all the conflict in the world and and bring forth Zion. And he heard that we were trying to build Zion. And so he wanted he wanted to join the church with that. I didn't know what to say. I, I thought, okay. 
And I looked out at the temple and I thought, no, this, this is where true equality in mm -hmm. life is. And I, and I thought of all of the Ukrainian babushki who lived through the communist occupation, the Nazi perestroika, and were still struggling. They, their whole lives they had struggled from the moment that they were born until possibly the day that they, they die. And where, how is the, where's the fairness in mm -hmm. life? Where's the equality? And all of these things flooded to my mind when I looked at the temple. And that's where it is. It's each individual making covenants uh, and then having the opportunity to receive everything that God has. And uh, it's everybody, no matter where you where you were born, when you were born, you will have that chance. That's what's the beauty about our temples today. You don't know, you know, from what station in life people are coming from, but we're all there for the same purpose to, to progress and continue towards eternal life. Which is interesting. If you, if you look at it from a, a, an angle where some would say, wait a minute, time out. I, I thought you were talking at the beginning of this uh, episode about Paul emphasizing grace. And now we're talking about <laughs> temple ordinances and these covenants and these things we need to do. It's fascinating that it's so easy if we're not careful to isolate our favorite scriptures or our favorite mm. doctrines or our favorite word or our favorite principles and then elevate those above all the other words of the prophets and the scriptures. If you look at Paul's writing, even right here to these Corinthian saints, Notice how he ends this chapter 15. In verse 57, he says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a beautiful embodiment of the doctrine of grace, right? And you'd say, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it, we're not thanking ourselves. We're not patting ourselves on the back because we were so good and we now have earned heaven mm -hmm. and we deserve it. It's all about the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But then look at verse 58. You have to read on. You have to read all of Paul. Therefore, which is his, here's the cause, verse 57, and the effect, the outcome, the result is in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I love that. How, how he brings in that you don't have to pit grace with appropriate righteous works and, and keeping of commandments as if they're in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. The fact that the Lord is actually willing to give us a temple with covenants offered to us there and commandments to keep, that is a, that is a shedding forth of his grace to us. Because if he didn't want us to, to be saved, he wouldn't tell us what to do. He would say, do whatever you want, which would then tie into closer to Satan's plan of either you have to do or it doesn't matter, eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you're going to die and it'll be well with you. So I love this when you read scriptures to try to find that balance between what's my role, what's his role, keep that very clear in mind, and then work on getting my uh, works and my faith and my perspective in line with his, as he then helps me grow up to become who I need to become. So there's a, there's a verse in here in chapter 16, uh, verse 13. And I love these few words that, that Paul uses. He says, watch ye stand fast in the faith. And Ken, I, I love what you do for your, I, I'm almost envious of, of your profession and, and working in the MTC with, especially as a, as a father of a missionary now, missionaries just, <laughs> they're on the next level for me. So the, the fact that you get to be there uh, with them every day, um, I, I think it's just, it's, it's wonderful. Um, will you speak to what has that taught you about the necessity for uh, not necessarily the youth today, but just in general as, as followers of Jesus Christ, as Latter-day Saints, for us to to follow this counsel that Paul has given us to watch and to stand fast in the faith. Well, I, I do pinch myself all the time that uh, there's no place like being with, uh, with the Lord's servants and 
It's a, it's a special feeling going onto the campus there. In a time where your word doesn't mean a lot, I mean, currently, that, that's the world we, we live in. We make excuses for ourselves. We do things. It's important that we stand. We stand fast and we watch what, what we're doing, and, that, and that's okay. Uh, maybe going back to being at the MTC, in verse 17, it says, I'm glad of the coming of Stephanus. And for, I don't know how to pronounce the Fortunatus. Fortunatus. I love that these converts came back with a reply to his, his letter. And in verse 18, he says, They have refreshed my spirit and yours. I love that because that's how I feel when I, we've spent time together here. You, you believe the audience has shared their faith in Christ. That helps me to stand strong and steady. A verse that you read, Tyler, reminded me of uh, Moroni, who was a kindred spirit with Ether uh, because they'd both seen the destruction of their people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moroni also saw the destruction of our day. So he'd seen ethers, he'd seen his own. He was putting down the history of the Jaredites, and he stops and he starts talking to us. We have two of the scripture mastery scriptures in this verse mm -hmm. from what Moroni teaches to us. But what was it that made him stop? Is verse four. Wherefore, whoso believeth in God might with surety hope for a better world, yea, even a place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God. Our anchor is Jesus Christ, period. And the hope that we have in him, that's how we stay faithful. That's how we abound in good works in this life. It's him. And that's what the missionaries are trying to do, become like him yeah. so that others can see him in them. That's so powerful, especially when you tie that concept back into what Paul says in chapter 15, verse 19, when he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. It's that idea that you've got to believe in not just the hope for this life, but in the hope that God wants to save you. He will resurrect you and he wants to save you. He wants to redeem you from everything. And if we can keep that, keep that end view in mind, it'll, it'll have huge impact on what I say, what I do, how I feel, how I think right now, not just today, but right now and how I treat my loved ones and, and how I interact with other people, it'll have, it'll change me. I hope that there are those who are watching today that will look at these chapters in a different light and with maybe a little more added uh, vigor in studying and really appreciate the words of Paul. I can't thank you both enough for what you've added to this, this whole episode, this whole conversation. And to me personally, it's been just a wonderful discussion and the feeling that you have brought here uh, has been very memorable. So thank you so much for what you've, what you've done for us today. And thank you for joining us at home for this conversation from the last few chapters of 1 Corinthians. We encourage you to record and act upon any impressions that you've received. We're also on Instagram at Come Follow Me. Join the conversation with us there and then join us next week right back here as we discuss reconciliation and forgiveness through the atonement of Jesus Christ. 